Somebody needs to be the change. Somebody needs to break the mold. Otherwise, generation after generation, we will continue to make those same mistakes. And getting married isn't a mistake, but it's not for everybody. So I left home. I left home at 21. Did I have a clue of what I wanted to do? <laughs> no, I didn't know what I was going to be doing apart from not getting married. So at the time, I was successfully working. I was sat in the office and the phone rang. My brother told me that he just found out that he's a dad. For the short term, a family member is trying to identify somebody who could step in to take care of this child. So could you please help out? And I said, oh, OK, yeah, how long are we talking? He said, uh, probably just a, a couple of weeks. I mm -hmm. didn't know anything about the process, which is all about identifying whether I'm a suitable match for my nephew. And that in itself is quite gruelling. She really wanted to know whether I was the right person and the first impression that she had of me probably in her eyes wasn't the right one. Someone's just come in, yes yeah, she's his auntie, only just found out, corporate lifestyle, travels a lot, is she really the right fit? to take yeah. care of this child. Did I ever regret making this decision? And no, no, I, I didn't regret it, but I often thought, will I be enough? Susie. Hello, Shivani. Welcome. Finally. Finally. Welcome <laughs> to Millennial Mind. Thank you. I'm so happy to have you here. I've been pestering you since season two, haven't I? You have. <laughs> and I, do you know what? We just spoke and I cannot believe that was two years ago. I know. Um, you know what? It's an absolute privilege. And actually, Shivani, to see your journey, you know, how you've excelled. And um, it's it's been really inspirational seeing that. And I've always wanted to be on the podcast, <laughs> but also when, you know, some of the topics uh, come yeah. up, uh, adoption, for example, being an adoptive single parent, um, you know, has its own sort of complexities mm -hmm. and challenges about, you know, how much can I share? Mm -hmm. um, because there's lots of other people involved. It's not just me. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you today. No, me too. I'm so happy that we finally got to do this. But for people who don't know who you are, can you just yeah. give a little bit of background? Where do I start? <laughs> well, um, well, for the longest time, I have been in media. So some people may recognize my voice or <laughs> my face, um, you know, many, many years ago from you know, starting out presenting Sunrise Radio, mm -hmm. um, TV work, hosting on stage. And I've been quite lucky to you know, dabble in the media side, but I've always had a corporate career as well. So that's mm -hmm. run parallel to media. Um, and then most people go, what do you do now, Susie? Which channel are you on? Yeah. Which radio station? I'm like, I'm not at the moment. At the moment, I, I am a consultant in organisational change. Oh my God, I did not uh, know that. Yes. I love that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> been through so much change myself. I, <laughs> you know, I should really be a bit of an expert at, at guiding people through changes in organisations. Um, and I'm quite passionate about that because, you know, every day we're going through changes. Some are monumental, some are small. Um, and my life journey um, has been full of changes. And I mm -hmm. guess I've embraced a lot of them. Um, they have paved the way um, of where I am today. When we spoke um, before this podcast, you know, when we had a conversation, your childhood was really significant, I think, in your journey. So can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it is something I've talked about and it's not uncommon um, in the Asian community. And I certainly felt it as I was growing up. Um, you know, being treated different to my brother, the fact that I was a girl, um, I often wondered where do I fit in? How do I fit in? Um, and for the for the most part, Shvani, I, I ignored it. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you, you know, of, are, are of that age when you're at school and, you know, you're surrounded by your other friends and they echo some of the things and you go, oh, this is fairly normal then. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my mum did have a difficult pregnancy. I was a premature baby born on Boxing Day. So, oh. yeah, you know, that was Christmas ruined. <laughs> <laughs> or double celebration. <laughs> <laughs> double celebration. Um, so I think when we talk about, you know, postpartum depression, that may have been something that my mum struggled with. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not something that's really talked about or expressed in the Asian community. Um, but, you know, there was outside influences, you know, people in the community telling my mum, oh, gosh, you better start saving up for her marriage. <laughs> and I was like, no, surely 
you know, somebody didn't actually say that. But, mm -hmm. you know, it is one of those things that is, is said in the community and girls aren't really celebrated. I mean, even to this day, um, I always struggled with understanding that and why. And as I, you know, was growing up, I noticed sort of clear differences um, yeah. between how, you know, my brother was treated, how I was and... Um, you know, the real emphasis on, you know, it's almost like a, a grooming process. Like, you know, you must learn how to cook and clean. So you true. must learn how to make round rotis. And, and yeah, I, I, I thought there's got to be more to life than just making round rotis. Yeah, and getting married. <laughs> yeah. And I think, yeah. you know, a lot of people, when when it, when we when I have these conversations, will say, well, that was in the olden days. Yeah. Ages. This doesn't happen anymore. And, you know, for a lot of people, it doesn't. Mm. But a lot of people, it still does. Yes. And I think that, you know, I've spoken about this countless times on this podcast. Marriage is at the forefront for me, for a or forefront for a lot of people that I know. And it is really the the only goal people want to see you do, yeah. right? Get married, have a house and have kids. And I think as a woman, that is seen to be our only goal. And mm. when there are children who go against that, when there are women who go against that, people find it uncomfortable mm. and they find it that we're, we're rebellious yes. and they find it that we're difficult mm. and I think being labeled all those things growing up and then trying to challenge them is is difficult enough in itself because you always have this conflict of interest mm. you know I kind of get where they're coming from but you know why why is it that, that that's the only thing that's pinned up against me you know why is that the only thing that's important about me surely I have other things yeah. that I can offer to the world apart from making round rotis and getting married, <laughs> you know? So I, I think that's really relatable to a lot of people. Yeah. And I think for me, you know, the older I got, especially in teenage years, and, and I, there's one thing I remember very clearly um, when I was at school um, and one of my friends, uh, we were we were in a graphic product design class and she mm -hmm. produced something that was just incredible. Mm -hmm. And I was complimenting her and saying, oh, this is fantastic. Is this what you want to do when you're older and get into sort of art and interior design? And she said, no, I'm getting married. And I said, oh, right. And she said, and I said, well, we'll surely be GCSEs and, yeah. uh, you know, you must have aspirations, career goals. And she said, no, but I'm getting married. I'm not even coming back for GCSEs. And <gasps> so how old was she, 15? She was 15 at the time. And it was that summer that, and I, I, I was kind of in disbelief when she first said it. And I thought, mm -hmm. no, surely that's not the case. She must be like joking. She must be joking. And sure as hell, I didn't see her. I, I then never did see her um, come back for her GCSEs. And I know of her today. Yes, she did get married. Um, she did have her children. Uh, was she happy? I don't know. But that that was quite hard hitting for me, Shwani, because I couldn't express that I just really struggled to say no. And I think on some occasions I did. Mm -hmm. And then my dad would say, but why not? We did it. <laughs> Yes, Dad. Is that your justification? Mm -hmm. You know, for for deciding the rest of my life, and I, I just couldn't comprehend it. Shani. I just, you know, for me, I I need rationale. I need logic. Even to this day, there's certain things that will go over my head, and I I would need the intricate detail yeah. to really understand them. And this is one thing I just could not get my head around. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, as I was sort of getting older. Um, I was trying to, I think, find a reason, a concrete reason that gets me out of this situation. And I tried my best. Um, I started working. Mm -hmm. I was earning good money. I expressed, you know, things that I wanted to do. Um, and we, we laugh about this, me and my friends now. But one of the things I did want to do was um, uh, become a cabin crew. Um, that was the great escape, Shivani. I need to get a, a <laughs> <Be> away. <laughs> yeah. And my friend, and I, I joked about it quite recently, and we, had, we, we were chatting about this, and he said, so what exactly was the grand plan, Susie? And I said, cabin crew, he said, you do realise that the flight comes back? And I was like, yeah, maybe I was going to just <laughs> one take way. it one way and yeah. say, right, I quit this job. Um, but yeah, th I just wanted them to be proud of me. I think I, mm -hmm. I wanted them to really see that I can, I'm more than just somebody who, you know, is a burden on you or somebody it's going to cost you money to, you know, get married off. Um, you know, I can add value. And I think I spent a lot of the time, you know, trying to 
please my parents, mm -hmm. you know, trying to give them reasons to say actually no, but they were so weighed down by, you know, the one thing that that comes up is that what will people in society do? So it's not necessarily their views, but mm -hmm. it's the views of others that have been enforced on them. And and I, I'll be honest, I spent a lot of the time trying to figure out these Loki, are they extended family? Who exactly are they? And where are they? How many of them is there? And where are they watching uh, yeah, from? Well, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> you know. um, but yeah, that, you know, the, that was going to be the reality. And unfortunately, it wasn't, it wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, I needed to go and find myself. So I left home. I left home at 21 mm -hmm. and there lay, you know, um, a road in front of me. I, I didn't know where I was going. I didn't have a destination in mind. I just knew that this is not something I wanted and I needed to separate myself from these daily conversations and, you know, this this conversation getting creeping ever closer with pictures coming from India and brother, my brother was having a bit of a laugh and going, oh, he looks good. Look, he's got some gold chain on. He's well to do. And, and I just thought, no, it's, it's just not me. It's, mm -hmm. it's not for me. And not right now. Yeah. And so, yeah, I set out on this journey and of, of self-discovery. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> pro love. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a struggle. That, that was a struggle in itself. All I knew in that moment is that I have to be earning to pay my way and to keep keep a roof over my head and that that was my number one priority do anything that doesn't turn this into a u-turn to yeah. to go back mm -hmm. uh, back home and that would have been failing for me and how did you do that well I was I was working at the time I left mm -hmm. and then I managed to get a job in sort of telesales okay. um, in Edgware okay in London so for the for the for the very short term I traveled. So I traveled from my hometown all the way to Edgware. I stayed with a friend of my brother's and it was sort of frowned upon. You know, there yeah. was conversations in the family to say, what on earth is she doing? She needs to come back home. You know, again, what will people make out of this? And I knew that just leaving home wasn't enough. I had to leave everything that was familiar behind. Yeah, I had to leave my hometown. That's that was the right. only way to sort of block out this noise and, yeah, start afresh. And were you talking about this at the time? Because I think, you know, unfortunately, and you see this not only in Asian culture, but in a lot of cultures, like mm. look at Harry and Meghan right now. Yeah. I hate mm. to bring it back to them. But mm. essentially, when people stand up for themselves mm. and when people say a response, people look down upon them mm. and think, you know, how could you say that about your family? Mm. That shows more reflection on you. But... I think there comes a point where you think, well, how long can I take it? Mm. And it's not necessarily about, you know, parading it all over the internet. I'm sure you didn't put an Instagram story up at the time or Facebook at the time no. and say, you know, like, <laughs> I've left, I'm leaving. <laughs> but there comes a point where you have to learn to do what's right for you. And mm. I think only we know that because mm. unfortunately, I think your environment is the most important thing in the world. Yeah. And if you're constantly in an environment where someone is putting you down, where someone says you're a burden, where someone is always saying, you know, you should leave, mm. then at some point you think, okay, I will. Yeah. But, you know, not, not everyone has the luxury of checking into a hotel or checking into paying rent straight away. Like yeah. if you're, you know, in, in a one bedroom flat, it's, mm. it's ridiculously expensive. So mm. to do that was really brave. And to take that decision to say, OK, I'm going to do this mm. is hard. And I'm sure no one told you that at the time. Everyone was telling you the opposite. But, you know, I can imagine how difficult that must have been for you. But you got through it, right? I got through it and here I am to tell the, <laughs> tell the story today. But, but equally, I, I suppose I've got my parents to thank in a sense um, because, you know, they, they made me quite street smart. And mm. yes, I had a really strict upbringing. And yes, it looked very different to my brothers, more lenient with him. Um, and we pushed the boundaries, both of us did. Yeah. Of course we did. Um, you know, there's no denying that. We did rebel. Yeah. Um, I am very headstrong. Um, mm. And... You know, in, in, in that moment, you know, becoming really sort of bit savvy with money, mm -hmm. that helped me. Because if I didn't have that and I didn't yeah. have the, the, the foundations mm -hmm. to be able to stand up on my to two feet, I it would have been, it would have failed. You know, I would have failed. Yeah. So I think in that sense, I had the means. 
and the funds to sort of say, I can make this work. Did I have a clue of what I wanted to do? <laughs> no, I didn't know what I was going to be doing apart from not getting married. And, yes. and, and that was the only thing that was on my mind at the time. And so, you know, my first job was in not technically the first job, but when I moved to London yeah. um, in telesales. Mm -hmm. And again, that again is, again is another skill, you know, the, these skills that we learn through doing different jobs was building that resilience, people saying no to me, calling them up and trying to sell them something. Mm. You know, that says, says a lot as, as well about the, you know, the kind of person that I became and the perseverance um, because I knew how important it was to be able to keep a roof and be able to um, financially support myself. And I love how d independent you were at that point because you're thinking, you know, okay, this isn't working out and I'm not going to rely on a man to yeah. to do everything yeah. for me. I have to do it myself. And, you know, it is, it's very, very difficult, especially when you come from a family where there's one path for you mm. to kind of go against it. And I think especially as a girl, you know, when you... Yeah. When you stand up for what you believe in, when you share your opinion, that isn't what's classified as a good daughter. Mm. And so when you're constantly labeled as something that you're not, it makes you doubt your, yourself. And I can imagine your self-worth and your confidence was knocked. Yeah, it, it, it was not a popular opinion by any means. And of course, there's questions. Of course, I left it open for my parents to pick up the pieces and mm -hmm. tell the Loki, you know, where where's the daughter? So, you know, I don't fully know what, what they did say at that time because emotions were high. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was judged for the choice that I had made. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably, you know, I'm not married today. So that is one thing that people will say, see, told you. parents were right. Yeah. <laughs> but I think because it was emphasized so much because it became literally the cornerstone to every conversation that it put me off. Yeah. I'll be honest, when it put me off the idea, just, you know, it just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say, you know, I don't want to get married. Um, but, you know, the, having such a strong emphasis on just that, and it wasn't an everyday conversation, it certainly became more prominent, mm -hmm. you know, as I was getting older. I mean, just just conversations in the street, you know, mm -hmm. when I, I'm taller than my mum and, and being tall by the community is seen as you are at that age of getting married. <laughs> and, you know, I, I look back sometimes and go, seriously, Somebody needs to be the change. Yeah. Somebody needs to break the mold. Otherwise, generation after generation, we will continue to make those same mistakes. And getting married isn't a mistake. No. You know, uh, but it's not for everybody. Yeah. And are you happy? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is the thing. You, you can be happy and unmarried. Yes. But you can also be married and happy. Yes. And that's totally fine. And yeah. I think it's all about individual choice. Yeah. But I think, you know, what you've just said is when something's so forced on you, and I've spoken about this with cooking, mm. with so many different things, when something's forced upon you, you almost like hate it because mm. you're you're so resistant to something that you're, you're pressurized to do. Yes. Now, one of the main reasons I wanted to speak to you today is because I've read about your story mm. of adopting your son mm -hmm. in the newspaper. And I remember reading that and thinking, oh my gosh. Now, adoption isn't really spoken about that much. I don't know anyone who's adopted a child, mm -hmm. especially within the Asian community, I don't know anyone. I've never heard of anyone who has adopted actually. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure people do do it, but I've never actually spoken to anyone who has before. So let's start with that process. What, what was going on at the time? So at the time, I was successfully working, um, very focused on my career, mm -hmm. loving life. Um, I was a sales and marketing director in a media distribution company, a great team, traveling the world, <laughs> you know, um, and, and yeah, just, just enjoying life. Um, and um, I was sat in the office one day and the, and the phone rang. And my brother um, told me that he just found out that he's a dad. Okay. And I was like, oh, congratulations. <laughs> um, and he told me that he just found out and he has a son who's now 10 months old. And for the short term, a family member, he's trying to identify somebody who could step in to take care of this child. And I said, oh, well, okay. 
course, there's a lot to take in that time. I said, well, who have you spoken to? He said, I spoke to mum and dad. And mum and dad are really not sure that they could do this right now. So could you please help out? And I said, oh, OK, yeah. How long are we talking? He said, uh, probably just a, a couple of weeks. Um, and I said, OK, yeah. I, who do I need to speak to? You know, let me have a conversation. And so I spoke to social workers. So at the time, my son was in foster care and he'd been there from day two of birth. And the reason behind that is complexities and around and the challenges around biological parents' additional needs. So they weren't able to care for him. But that wasn't to say that that wasn't set in stone. They were trying to find a way that they could care for him. But until, you know, that decision was reached in that interim period, he was in foster care. So through this process, I learned a little bit more about his needs, um, where he was, why he was in the care system. And I kind of went into it really blindly, Shivani. I, I mm-hmm. didn't know anything about the process. There was things being said about assessments, identifying somebody, sharing parental responsibility, all these words that were were unfamiliar to me. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, look, let's, you know, back to basics, what is involved here? And the social worker said, well, look, we will need to see whether you are suitable, first of all, to be able to put yourself forward. And in the meantime, there's assessments going on with biological parents to see that whether they are fit to then take custody. Yeah. So these things are running parallel and I have put myself forward and I'm going through the the quite intrusive assessment Uh, process, which is all about identifying whether I'm a suitable match um, for my nephew. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is quite grueling um, process because it brings up things that you don't think about in in the day to day, you know, questions around my upbringing, Mm -hmm. um, relationships, any significant events. And there's something that is... um, linked to children that come from a looked after background or certainly adoptive children and that is attachment trauma okay talk to me about that. and attachment trauma occurs and there's there's lots of studies around this now this research it's backed by science so if you imagine um a mum uh, who's pregnant and there's a baby developing inside and that that whole journey that process those nine months that is attachment and that is a bonding that that baby is already doing okay. with birth mum. And that's through either voice, sounds, mm-hmm. feelings, all the emotions that mum's going through and smells. Feels, yeah. So that baby has an expectation when the baby's born. And when that baby is separated, you know, either moments after birth or days or months after birth that is what is now known as the attachment trauma because everything with the baby everything with in in a toddler's life or any child's life who is in the care system that's their identity that's Mm -hmm. what they know and when that is removed that's where that deep trauma comes from and this now has a this has an impact um and obviously I'm no expert at this but I have been on several courses to understand uh and 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 this was important to me because there were things that I was seeing um with my son when he was placed with me and and stuff that I didn't understand and Mm -hmm. I was asking all these questions so what essentially happens is it impacts the cognitive side, the developmental side of the brain. And those formative years, you know, it's it's social anxiety. Mm-hmm. It could be, you know, the way they express that and that could be internalized. It can be externalized. So there's lots of different behaviors and things that you see. Some of them we now call or identify as being on the ASD or autism spectrum. Okay. Others call it ADHD disorder, but because the traits are so similar, it's really, really difficult to identify the true cause of this. Yeah. And so when I met my son, I first met him 
in foster care mm -hmm. and in fact no I, I saw I first saw a photograph of him the mm -hmm. social workers and these were studio shots and, really yeah, and <laughs> I was like oh he's absolutely adorable yeah he's beautiful I've seen he that. he's I fell in love I think from well, the first picture was my brother shared with me um he sent it on the mobile phone and it actually looked exactly like he did really? when he was a toddler um and then you know this whole idea this whole excitement, roller coaster of emotions, but not really truly knowing whether I'm going to be successful in this process. That mm -hmm. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so going back to the assessments that I was having, one of the questions were anything significant that happened in your childhood? How was the relationship with your parents? And there is uh, an episode in my childhood where I was sent to India when I was eight years old. Why? Um, and the reason behind that, I mean, again, quite common, you know, for uh, parents that have emigrated and I want to um, set up shop here and, um, you know, starting a family. So parents being quite young, two children, both wanted to go and work so that they could secure the future and they could okay. give us everything. And uh, through that, it was decided that, you know, it might be better for me. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because I'm the girl, um, but it w might be better for me to, I don't know how long this was planned for, whether it's indefinite, um, for me to go to India, live with my nana nani, and they will take care of me while both parents will go out and work okay. and couldn't afford, you know, childcare for two children. So your brother stayed here? So my brother stayed okay. here. Um, and I only ended up being at Manana Nani's in India for a year um, okay. because I got so sick in the summer. Um, so I was, I came back. Okay. But that was, that was something that kept coming up and I kept being asked, how did I feel? Mm -hmm. And how did that impact me? And that probably was my trauma. That's something that I had forgotten about and this whole assessment had triggered it. And it really got me thinking. Um, and I think really what the assessor wanted to know at the time is that would you be in a position to do that? Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, no, that's not something I would think about. But I could see where it was coming from. And it became very difficult for me to answer that because I hadn't made that decision. And it's that that fear of abandonment. Maybe it is something that I have carried, that trauma, something that is quite embedded, quite deep within me but it came up through this process. And that, in addition to that, Shivani, there's lots of other things that came up and I mm. felt in a way that I was kind to play them down or uncut, you know, sort of cover them up, suppress them in a yeah. way, because I was worried. I was worried that, you know, people making a decision, how would this be perceived? And will this go, go against me? Mm -hmm. And will this be the barrier between me and adopting my nephew um but it wasn't it, mm -hmm. it you know through sort of trying to suppress some of the things that went on I you know then had to say look this is this is getting a little bit difficult for me this conversation and perhaps I haven't been entirely honest and I thought I can't start this journey based on lies so let me just be really <laughs> honest and just yeah. say it how it was um and I felt that I'd lightened the load. And and, I th and another person who was really influential in that is um, the foster carer. Um, she really wanted to know whether I was the right person. And the first impression that she had of me probably in her eyes wasn't the right one. Um, you know, someone's just come in. Yes, yeah, she's his auntie. Only just found out corporate lifestyle travels mm. a lot. Is she really the right fit? To take yeah. care of this child so I felt like I was going through a series of assessments <laughs> from lots of different people and that that was quite difficult that that had an impact on me mentally yeah you know it took me back to adversities and maybe some dark areas of, of my childhood that I had packed up and they were far away removed from me as possible so that that period in my life was really really difficult um, and that uncertainty of, you know, where is this going to go? 
um, matching panel and all the other things that come with the with the process. Anyone going through it would know that. But the one thing that isn't really talked about, and I guess because there's still it's still being identified, is that children are in the care system due to a c- tragedies, lots lots of different things that have perhaps gone very wrong mm-hmm. in their early years. And, and that's something that, um, I can't remember whose quote it is, but it's a really, really good, good quote. I think it's um, Jodie Landers, uh, who says, um, a child born to another woman calls me mummy. You know, the magnitude of that tragedy and the depth of that privilege. And it, it sticks with me, that one, because there is so much loss wrapped up in this entire process of adoption that, you know, you can't possibly ask anyone to be grateful. You know, sometimes people go, oh, you know, your son is so lucky um, to have you. And I said, he might not ever see it as that way. You know, for him, he doesn't have a relationship with his biological parents. Mm. You know, the trauma of that is something that I learned that children never quite overcome. They just learn to manage it better, you know, and it's the responsibility of the parents to teach them strategies and techniques, you know, because in a way, you know, you think they do have something to be grateful for. My son has a loving, safe, Mm. nurturing environment, but the flip side of that is he, you know, he will in life wonder why. <sighs> Sorry. You know, <laughs> he will think automatically if I was him, why didn't my birth parents want me? <sighs> Even though I, put, <laughs> I had the conversation with you, I still, it's still so difficult because... I think everyone in life, the only thing really that everybody wants is to feel loved Mm. by anyone. Ultimately, that is all everyone wants in life. Nobody cares, at the the root of it, no one cares about the fancy things or the the amazing things that happen to you, whatever career you have. Ultimately, if if you feel unloved and you feel that rejection or you feel that abandonment, Mm. that feeling is always gonna supersede everything. Yeah. And that's so hard to process. And, you know, when I spoke to you on the phone and you said, sometimes when he says thank you to you, you always say, never, ever say thank Mm. you to me. Taking on that responsibility is so admirable. Mm. And I think, you know, it's such a selfless thing to do. Whether you think he should be grateful for you to not, it's kind of like a separate issue. And And I agree with what you're saying. But I think, you know, to do that, is so selfless. It's it's really unbelievable, actually, to take that and say, you know, I'm gonna raise him. Because I'm sure there was a lot of questions, you know, from what you've just said around the fact that you were told you have to get married, you have to have kids, mm-hmm. you, you can't, can't leave the house, or you know, you can't be independent. So then now, adopting your brother's son and taking him as your own, what, what were some of the things that were said to you? So within the family circle, because the the one thing when you're going through the process is you do need to identify a support network. Okay. So there is no discrimination. And I didn't know some of these things. I didn't know that you can adopt as a single person. You can adopt a same-sex couple. You don't need to, you know, be working full time. You don't need to have a huge bank balance. None of these things matter um, as long as you can provide a safe, nurturing, loving environment. Those are just the key things, the basic ingredients that are required. Um, So, you know, within the family circle, I'd identify my aunties and I'd put them forward because they had to do a character reference. Um, So I'm really grateful that, you know, they helped me along my journey. It's solely a decision that I had made. And yes, it is one of the biggest most important decisions of my life and some may say it was an impulsive decision because I didn't spend any time mulling over it at all Mm -hmm. as soon as I put that handset down on that phone call I decided that this is something I want to do and some of my colleagues said 
do you have any idea how much impact this is going to have on your life? Yeah. Your whole life is going to change, you know? And I was convinced at the time that, no, it's going to be fine. I'm going to yeah. do it all. Yeah. I can work. Yeah. Um, I can raise a child. There's yeah. nothing I can't do. Mm-hmm. Um, but how wrong was I? Because I had completely underestimated what is involved in raising a child single-handedly. I think a lot of parents feel that way. I remember having Carly on the podcast and she said, there's no manual when you have a baby and there should be one. Why is there no one? Why does nobody talk around Mm. it? And I think it's because, you know, similar to what, you know, your dad said, everyone else does it. So you just get on with it and you almost feel like it's normal, but it's hard to raise a child. Mm. And look, every single parent makes mistakes. Every single child makes mistakes. It would be nice if there was a crash course on it because, yes. you know, everyone wants to avoid that situation. But I think there's added layers of complexity in your situation, right? Yeah. And sometimes I feel there should be a manual, but then sometimes I also feel perhaps not. Mm. Perhaps not, because we're all going to muddle through. We're all going to make mistakes. And I sure as hell did. And and actually, there's an interesting story when I first met in person, my idea of 10 months old was very different to what I witnessed. Mm. So there I am at the contact centre and um, my son is with his foster carer and he's learning to walk. And I'm like, oh, wow, okay. (laughs) I was not expecting that. (laughs) And um, there was an instant bond. There Mm -hmm. there was something there that, it's going to sound a little bit silly, but I felt like I know you. There's a deeper connection here. And that was instant. There was just something mm. that, you know, in that moment, I thought I, I must have met you somewhere. There, there's there's something here that's more yeah. than just I'm your paternal aunt. There's definitely I don't think that's silly. Yeah, I think there are some people you meet and you just mm. connect with them yeah. more than anything. And you think, I don't know, you're in my life for yeah. a reason yeah. or I've met you finally. Or, yeah. you, know, you know, I just feel this connection and I feel this love towards you. And often you can't explain why. And you just have this extra love for this person. And I don't think that's silly at all. Yeah, so I felt like we were soulmates, essentially. Mm. It was love at first sight. And um, of course, my my close circle were a little bit concerned, but very happy for my decision. But again, Mm. I I guess they really were trying to paint a picture and and sort of, you know, none of them being parents wanted to, yeah, just sort of say that this is going to have a a big impact Mm -hmm. on your life. Um, family, again, supportive in the sense that, yes, we can support you, but from a distance. Um, so were you speaking to them at this point? Yeah, I, I, okay. d- I think for the most part of, I mean, I've always had an estranged relationship with my parents. So mm-hmm. it's something that they couldn't do. Mm-hmm. And that's fine to say no. Were they over the moon about my decision? No. Um... <laughs> Some of the things that were said were, you know, you're ruining your life. Mm. Who's going to marry you now? Um, And that's interesting because by default, I feel like, and I, 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 I feel this even today, is by default, through my decision of adopting uh, my nephew, I automatically fell into the divorce category Mm. because I'm a single mum. And I have a child. So how society views me, their perception is very much she doesn't have a husband, she's divorced. Or worse still, something that my uncle um, thought that people might say. So this was um, at a family gathering Mm -hmm. and um, Raphael, my son, was a little toddler, absolute charmer. Everyone's in love with him. Uh, My grandma's wondering who this utterly adorable kid is um she suffered from dementia bless her and um i was just about to tell her and my uncle at the time said no 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 no, no. don't say anything because um she will tell everybody and you know and that her telling everybody comes from a place of love and celebration yes and i said what's wrong with that Mm -hmm. and he said oh you know, society, you know, uh, people will make judgments and uh, nobody's going to believe that that's your brother's son. They're going to think it's your illegitimate child. 
And I, I was stunned. <laughs> and I was like, right, so I can't tell my grandma who this is because, again, we're going back to that. It keeps these, these people in society, the Loki, keep rearing their ugly heads and, you know, time and time again. And I, and I have conversations with my dad now and we, we you know, I, I try my best to get them out of that mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, those myths and those misconceptions that exist within our community. And I say to him, quite frankly, I don't care mm -hmm. what people think. These people don't pay my bills. Yeah. These people are not part of my support network. I don't give a damn. And I'm more than happy to have this conversation if you're struggling. I think when you're trying to do something good mm. in life, whatever that may be, if someone says something negative about you and twists it into mm. a negative thing, as much as it breaks your heart that someone could possibly think that of you or mm. someone's trying to find a fault in every single thing you do, it always says more around their personality mm. than yours. Mm. And at the time when it happens, I'm sure, and at the time you probably felt broken by that. You know, how how could you think that people could say that? Or how could you think that of me? Because I've tried to do something good here and I'm still being criticized for it. Yeah. But I think it's so important to to try and zoom out and think, you know, if I've done something kind, mm. if I've done something with love and I've done something with a good intention and you're going to nitpick your way to say that I'm a bad person or I've done a terrible thing or there's fault and that fi try and find any flaw, mm. then at the end of the day, it's more it's more an insecurity or an unhappiness within you. Yeah. And it's more something that you need to work on, I think, mm. than me. Because mm. if you're seeing the negative in everything and yeah. everyone, yeah. That is exactly what you're going to attract in life. Because within everyone and everything, you can see a positive or a negative. Not one person on this planet is perfect. Not mm. one po person on this planet is filled with flaws. Yeah. But if you're constantly choosing to see the negative in that person, then that is only what you'll see. Mm. And so it just comes from a place, I think, of acceptance and letting go, right? Yeah, and I, I feel like we, so that, there's a, you know, that generation, is there a parent's generation, they are almost like conditioned that we have somebody to answer to. Mm. Aren't they? Yeah. So it's very much like, why? Why do we mm -hmm. care? People are going to gossip anyway. Yeah. I'm sure they're going to come up with their own theories. Yeah. And so the other conversations that became a little bit awkward, I guess, is is just conversations that I'm now having because my whole circle has changed. You know, from becoming a parent overnight, you know, the dynamics of friendships yeah. have changed. And for the best part, I think at least certainly for the first year, Shivani, it was just me. It was just me and my son behind closed doors. And that was a shock to my system um, mm. because I, I did have to give up my job. Okay. And so I had very little human interaction, we mm -hmm. could call it. Um, you know, in my efforts to make this bonding process successful and positive attachment, I mm. I just had to you know, spend that time in learning and understanding. And of course, you know, I had the the care system, the support network to rely on, but there was things quite early on that didn't quite look right. So okay. I had co contact. Uh, so, you know, through this, as I'm going through the process after work on Friday, I drive down to my hometown, uh, drive up rather. Um, I always <laughs> get my bearings <laughs> on, drive up to my hometown and spend a few hours just learning routine. You know, I'd spend time with um, foster carer. She'd uh, talk about, you know, routine, likes, dislikes. And I'd get to see, you know, from dinner time to bedtime routine. Mm. And... I'd sit there and I'd see the attachment and I'd see the strong bond that my son had with his foster carer. And a part of me used to think, will I ever have that? Yeah. You know, this kid was 18 months old when he turned up at my door. And did you know at that point you were going to look after him forever? Because I remember at the start of this, you said it was for a couple of weeks. Yes. At what point did that change? So 
it was only ever supposed to be a couple of weeks until it became really apparent that biological mum and dad won't play a part in this. Um, and so I was going through a kinship carer. And what that really is, it's a different kind of permanence. Um, talking about um, shared responsibility, parental responsibility. So either it stays with the local authority and you share it or you share it with biological parents. So I opted for an open adoption, okay. which means that I can then promote some contact, whether that's in person or whether that's letterbox, phone calls. And, you know, I always wanted my son to have that relationship and be very aware mm. of his early years. Um, so when he even moved in, he was, there's so many different orders that it, it wasn't adoption. The adoption didn't go through till two years after. So, I, wow. yeah, I clearly remember it was the 5th of December, 2011. And there I was already for Christmas and I'd gone out and purchased lots of different toys and slightly hungover because I did uh, <laughs> go out um, a couple of nights before. Thought I'd get in my last night of freedom. Yeah. Um, but it was it was a bit surreal. And I have a I have a diary of that day. I I managed to journal some of what was going through, mm. some of how I was feeling. Um And how were you feeling? I was excited. I was nervous. I was scared. Yeah. Um and and everything that day, as 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 time was ticking, led up to that moment that the doorbell rang, mm -hmm. and there I was with my bottle of oil. <laughs> my bo a bottle of oil. A bottle of oil, because you know I I had to mark this occasion with you know whatever little I knew. Okay. It, you know him taking his first steps. Oh, um, I see. Okay. In, into the home, and the, I'm sure the foster carer thought, "What on what earth are you?" Doing? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And then he walked in and I think the hardest thing at that time, Shivani, was <sighs> saying bye to the foster carer. That was something that was really difficult and I could see she was struggling. Why? This attachment that she had with him for so long, that's probably the hardest thing she had to do. Mm. And then that door closing and then... There I was with this little person who I'd assume lifelong responsibility for. Did I have a clue what I was doing? Not really. What did I have to give? I had unconditional love. And I knew that I wanted this to work so badly. Because at that point, that trauma that I talked about from my own childhood that fear of abandonment yeah. that just hit me in the face in that moment and I thought this little person his whole world right here right now with all my best intentions has just been turned upside down because you're yeah. he's now separated from everything he knew up to that moment and that one person who's been a constant figure in his life from birth, has just walked out that door. There was that girl attached. <sighs> yeah. Oh, it's 11 years ago, but it's... I can imagine, it brings you back to that it because it's... you right back to that moment, yeah. <sighs> because I think I felt her pain as well. Mm. I sensed it when she used to speak to me. Yeah. She was bringing me up to speed. She wanted this to be a success, but... It was probably painful for her. so painful, yeah. It's, it's really... Um, I think the job that foster carers do is... Yeah, they don't get the credit that they deserve. Um, in my eyes, they, they are... They are far superior than than any parent um, bringing up a child because, you know, they're raising these little people knowing full well. Mm. They, they have to hand them over at some point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, also, that is the end goal for them. Yeah. You know, that is the main objective to ensure that they find their forever family. 
And, um, you know, I hear of beautiful stories where, you know, foster carers themselves have decided to adopt children within wow. their care. Because there also is something that's relatively unknown, Shani. There is that, that age, let's call it a desirable age for anybody who is choosing to go through the adoption process because that is their only means of having a family. You know, maybe they can't, for whatever reason, have biological children. Maybe they've exhausted um, a lot of time, a lot of money into the whole IVF process. Mm -hmm. And then this becomes their last resort. And I suppose for for them, um, they have to find a child that is going to be a suitable match. And generally, when people approach this process they want to go for babies right because they feel that if it's a baby mm -hmm. then you know their character hasn't developed they could nurture and mold that they could potentially even with what little they know about attachment and trauma and loss uh, at that time they feel that it's a good starting point yeah and then the older children get in the care system, the longer they stay in that care system, the harder it becomes for you to parent them. So sometimes in foster carers decide that actually, I want to assume lifelong responsibility for this child because mm -hmm. I can't possibly let them go through any more instability. Yeah. It's just not fair. And so I think that's a beautiful thing to do. And I felt that a part of my son's foster carer she would have liked to have done that mm -hmm. and you know 18 months is is a long time of course in in a in a toddler's life it is and those beginning years I think obviously none of us remember them but I'm sure if something happened within those years yeah. we would do, yeah. do, you, do you know what I mean yeah. I think like we are, we're not we're not consciously aware but subconsciously yes. we probably yeah. are yeah and I think you know what well, it's just everything you've just said I've just never known Right, I've never even thought about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not when you're not really in a situation, you never think about it like that. And mm -hmm. of course, the, that's the hardest thing for a foster carer to mm -hmm. raise a child, knowing they're going to be taken away from them one day. Yeah. It's so difficult. And how do you how do you properly how do you properly care for them? How much mm -hmm. love? Because you know, how hard much of a you. bond can you have? You have yeah. to sort of be a little bit restrictive. You've got to hold back. You do. Because it's, it's def definitely really hard for them. And that's what I mean. I never had thought about that before. Yeah. Going through that process and obviously, you know, now having your son who's how old is he? He's 12 years He's old. 12. Yeah. How did he take it when you told him? And, and how did you tell him? Because I presume that's a difficult conversation mm. to have and mm. to think about when's the right time to tell them yeah. as well. Yeah, there, there's no right or wrong time. Um, I don't think. But I always wanted... I, 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 and maybe, does it... Does it get a little bit easier? Perhaps for me, was it easier because I am paternal aunt? Maybe. Mm -hmm. It's never an easy conversation. And that's why I never wanted to have it at any sort of, I didn't have a time or an age. So I, you know, just weaved in these conversations uh, in an age appropriate manner. So there's one thing that they call the life story book. Okay. And in a very simple way, it's documented um, for children to understand a little bit about their background because we all want to know. Mm. We all want, you know, to know about our background, who do we look like, who do yeah. we take after, why do we do the quirky things that we do. Um, so it's important for me to tell him um, quite early on, I say early on, um, I think he must have been around three or four when we started having these initial conversations, just sitting with a very simple life storybook, going through photographs, um, giving him the opportunity to ask questions. Um, we did a documentary on interfamily adoption when I was at the BBC, and, and that became um, another you know, opportunity to have a conversation. And, it, and it's always difficult to, to sit down and, and have these conversations because my son's interests um, have to be at the, at the core of everything I say and do um, in this space. So as much as I, you know, like to raise awareness, I like to, you know, um, talk about or have difficult conversations, I have to always remember that this information is in the public domain and one day he will have access to it. Yeah. Um, but I have been 
very, very honest, you know, through through this whole process. Um, we have conversations even, you know, on, on occasions. Um, because the one thing I, I quite often get asked as well um, is, did I have any regrets? Did I ever regret making this decision? And no, no, I, I didn't regret it. But I often thought, will I be enough? Have I made the right decision for him? Would he have been better being, you know, in a family with more children or a two parents um, setting? I often, I often think that because, you know, with, with, with children that come from that looked after setting, um, you often wonder that. Um, and it's only because there were there were very difficult moments, like you know, with him being very aware, mm -hmm. you know, from a very young age. I, I I noticed changes from day two, so he was quite used to spending staying with me overnight. At, to this point, it's the latter okay. part of this placement at the time, which is again not adoption, but this placement with his family member. He knew his routine. And it hit me at day two when he wouldn't get into the bath. And he realized that something's not quite right here. You know, I'm not supposed to be here now. I'm supposed to be going back to my foster home. And that's when I became very aware um, how clued up children really are, toddlers. Wow. You know, how much they thrive on routine. Mm. Um and then the sleep pattern, which is another way of, you know, it's that it's that trauma, it's that unsettledness, it's possibly even what we call nightmares, because I couldn't see his feelings. He did at times express them. Mm -hmm. He will just get better at handling it. At handling it. <sighs> I think it's so tough to hear that because I think often with with adoption, I think a lot of people say this now, especially, you know, there's so many horrible things that are happening in the world. Mm. Why would you have your own child? There's loads of children that are suffering. Mm. But there's so many levels of complexity that we don't understand. Mm. And I guess even for you, like you're saying in your journey, even when you had chosen to take that route, you didn't understand all of them. No, no. We physically possibly can't. Mm. Every child is different. Every child will have different things that are going on with them and make them who they are. Yeah. But what's really tough is that I've never heard it from from that perspective anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine how difficult it is to navigate through that. Because yeah. not only have you kind of faced your own kind of trauma in your own childhood and then pushed through, but then, you know, you've willingly done this. This isn't something that you, you've ever said, you know, I didn't want to do it. You've willingly done this and you feel a little bit helpless, I presume, at times. You do. And it's, it's you know, it's I think it's that secondary trauma on top yeah. of that is, you know, when, when you're there, you know, um, you know, through, when he's had his afternoon naps, you know, he, he did have acid reflux. So mm -hmm. some of it I thought was linked to that. Um, and he'd have his afternoon nap. And every afternoon, once he's woken up, he would spend an hour crying. He was inconsolable. Um, I would just hold him tight and he'd push away. And that is the hardest thing to see as well. And some of it maybe was linked to him being in a little bit of pain mm -hmm. with his reflux. But I think a lot of it was linked to trauma, trauma, and that bond. Gosh, you know, and to why see that am as I a baby yeah, as well? And, and and not being able to verbalize that, but verbalizing it in a way that I can't understand. Of course, that was the hardest thing to see, and and that you know did have a major impact on my mental health. I can imagine. You know, there there were nights, and I and I'm sure new parents will be able to relate to this. When you just want a break, mm -hmm. you just want your baby, or your child, to go to sleep because it's already been a full on day, and you just want a break. And there were nights that I would spend holding his little hand through the rails of the cot because that was his little. Mm, safety, safe space, safe yeah. space, and his little blanket, and he'd like to hold my hand, but I'm exhausted at this point. And just when I think he's nodded off, I'm slowly trying to, and then he holds it even tighter. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, we've got to start all over again. <laughs> and there were some nights that I would come downstairs, 
And I was physically, emotionally, mentally broken. And at, at those times I thought, I, I'm, I'm just not enough. I don't think I'm enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think I can do this. There were times where I thought that. And how did you overcome that? <laughs> oh yes um, I overcame that by being open to talking about what I was going through you know mm -hmm. reaching out to my support network speaking to social workers and saying there are things that I don't understand and in order for me to um, approach these um, I want to be educated I want to understand what this means how do I overcome it mm -hmm. and you know there's a wealth of information out there there's 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 a big investment that goes into ensuring that children we're, we're placing them in the right setting but also the aftercare so thankfully yeah. you know that was available to me just having conversations because for the best part Shvani I'd shut everybody out yeah you know even you know the foster carer, she said, we, we, won't, we won't meet now till the new year. So from the 5th of December, we didn't have any contact. And, and that was because it was important for Rafi to bond Which and identify me as his primary caregiver. And so we didn't. But when we did, there's, there's always that fear of relapse. And mm. is this a good thing or mm. a bad thing? Um, so for me, you know, those those difficult nights and opened up lots of conversations that I perhaps wouldn't have wouldn't have had um speaking to friends reaching out for help and support because for the you know best part I was doing this all alone mm -hmm. and I, and it and I found it always hard to ask for help I still do I, I could be lost in the middle of nowhere it won't occur to me to ask somebody I mean thankfully we have <laughs> maps now but there was a time that I am guessing my way and crossroads oh we'll take a right can't go much wrong when you're taking a right but you know I I am that person I yeah. I've you know I need to work on myself more mm -hmm. to ask for help but I think, you know, given what you've said today in terms of how you haven't been able to rely on anyone and you've mm. been labelled as a burden, you never want to go out of your way to kind of ask for something yeah. or even if it's the smallest thing like direction. And, you know, talking to someone is the most important thing you can do mm. because often we feel we can handle things by ourselves, yeah. Yeah. but it's so easy to close ourselves off. And sometimes I do that as well. I just mm. close myself off from everyone. But... That's something that always helps me get through my problems is speaking to someone and mm. speaking to someone without judgment and speaking to someone who isn't going to criticize everything you every single thing you do mm. can be a lifesaver but from being in a family where someone does do that it's difficult to want to reach out for their help so i completely understand why you felt that way and you know thank you for being so open mm. and for being so honest because sharing this isn't easy and it takes a lot of courage to come on here and talk around your experience and your journey. So I really thank you for coming on today and, and being so transparent with me. It means so much. No, oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, Shivani. I, I always find that uh, podcasts uh, are quite therapeutic in that <laughs> sense. Um, you, know, it, you know, they take you back to a time and place that, you know, is pivotal. Um, you know, a huge part of your growth, yeah. I, I would say. And, and, and these are also those little reminders that we need to reflect on you yeah know, we don't do that enough and mm -hmm. you know that's why we have people like you who you know are open and willing to sit and have these conversations because somewhere along this journey I think what we don't do is praise ourselves enough exactly you know, and you should no parent ever says you know I'm doing a great job yeah you know, I'm doing the best I can and and I you know I've over the years I've got I've gotten better at doing that so um well if you haven't heard it you are doing a great job you. you're incredible you're inspiring and I'm so grateful to have spoken to you today because you really really are so strong and you should be so proud thank you so thank you it's my pleasure thank you everyone and thank you so much for listening and watching this podcast wherever you're listening or watching if you could please press the follow like and subscribe button it would really mean the world to me